Hey Ecofictologists! I just wanted to pop in for a second before we get started to let you know that what you're watching right now might seem like, oh it's 37 minutes, that's a really long video, but actually this is the super edited version of my two hour chat with Forrest Brown. It turned into a bit of a therapy session about this book because we had a lot of feelings to get through. If you want to see the longer version, it will be available on my Patreon, uh, the unedited two hour long version. Be warned, this will be full of spoilers. I have tried to avoid spoilers in this edited version as much as possible, at least the really big ones I've edited out. If you've read the overstory and maybe you have a lot of feelings about it and need to have some of those feelings discussed, um, which I understand, then uh, head on over to my Patreon and become a patron and get access to the unedited version. Alternatively, if you don't really mind having the audio without the video, you can head on over to Stories for Earth podcast, which Forrest Brown um, makes, and hear our conversation there. So you've got three options. I'm laying out a buffet of options for you. But this, what you're watching right now, is the, as spoiler-free as I can make it, shortened, edited version of my chat with Forrest Brown. Enjoy. Hey you go Fictologists, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lovis and today we're doing something a little bit different. Normally my book reviews are just me, but today I have a very special guest. Um, this is Forrest Brown and uh, we've connected over the Rewilding Our Stories Discord server and um, realized, you know, there's really no reason why we shouldn't do a collaboration video. And we had both just finished the overstory, so we thought this is the perfect opportunity. So welcome, Forrest. Thanks for being here. Hey, Lovis. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be on the show. A little nervous, but excited. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a shared emotion. We're good. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't you um, do a little introduction to what you do? Because you're also very active in the ecofiction community. Yeah. And let everyone know what you're, what you're up to. Yeah. So... Hello, eco-fictologists and also Stories for Earth listeners. Um, my name is Forrest Brown, and I make a podcast called Stories for Earth, which is a podcast that's all about um, just climate change and pop culture, um, really just climate change depicted in any kind of work of fiction. And we are medium agnostic, so <laughs> I talk about <laughs> books, I talk about movies, like I haven't done a TV show yet, but I'll do it one day. Um, just did a musical album. You did a music album, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I just did one. Um, it's coming out this coming week. Um, it's on Infest the Rat's Nest by a band called King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, who are like an Australian psychedelic rock band. Yeah, that was like a lot all in one sentence. But yeah, yeah. I've been listening to the podcast for a little while and um, I love it. It's so good. Thank it's you. so good to spread spread my, my horizons a little bit just yeah. out of the world of just books. <laughs> Yeah. I think I'd actually started watching your YouTube channel before the Discord existed. So um, oh. yeah, it's cool that we're actually getting to talk to each other because we, I feel like, kind of have like-minded interests. So yeah. Definitely, definitely. Started. And I think that's something that's really good about the Discord channel as well, mm -hmm. just getting so many people together who um, have like-minded interests and yeah. can have a so nerdy cool discussion there. about eco-fiction and everyone just joins in with the enthusiasm. I love it. Yeah. This is really yeah. just one long extended commercial for the Discord server. I'm it really kidding. is. It's a massive <laughs> plug. Yeah, you should yeah. all join. You should all join the Discord channel. Yeah, you should though. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, we've got we've got academics, we've got researchers, we've got readers, writers, mm -hmm. publishers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool it's people. It's all happening over on the Discord server. So <laughs> Link is in the description below. There it is. Yep. <laughs> there it is. All right, moving on. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so today we are talking about The Overstory by Richard Powers. And I took a really long time to read it, um, which we'll probably get to while we're talking about it. But um, yeah. <laughs> all um, will be explained. <laughs> yeah, like you were saying, it is just a thick book. It's like I don't know, like 800 pages or something like that. Um, it's pretty long. There's a lot going on. There's nine main characters, which is a lot. Yes. Um, yeah, and it covers decades. 
Um, but that actually brings me to a spoiler warning because yes. normally my book reviews are spoiler free. Um, but because we're just going to be chatting, uh, we're not really going to censor ourselves. Um, so there may be spoilers <laughs> contained in this video. If you don't want any spoilers, um, you might want to stop watching now yeah, and I guess. just Go take book, our recommendation that you should read The Overstory by yeah. Richard Powers. So yeah, the story, the book really starts by introducing our nine main characters. And that's really like the first what like first half of the book it's a pretty yeah. solid chunk of the book is just introducing the characters and when that's I say what I thought. yeah that's why it was a little bit it's one of those books that like you pick up speed as you go yes. through it and the first half like one of the big pieces of advice that I would give people reading this book is just stick with it just don't yeah. give up <laughs> because some it, it is kind of you lose the speed a little bit if every chapter you're switching to a new perspective mm -hmm. and like at first they kind of you learn so much history about these characters yes. and you're like when is something going to happen yeah but it does it is all necessary and it all is packed full of symbolism and things that yeah, just get passed so through the generations so just stick with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it all kind of it's kind of cool how it all um sort of coalesces and you get to see how the different character timelines um eventually um i guess kind of intersect and then from there we like see the main story of the overstory uh which begins like after all the characters have finally met or are starting to meet i guess mm -hmm. um and actually some of the characters don't ever meet i should say that too no they don't but yeah. they're like they're all kind of intertwined like yeah. something happens over here and it affects something that's happening over yeah. here so eventually it is kind of you're moving forward in a mm -hmm. you know maybe a little wavy but you're you're moving in one direction yeah, whereas the like first a puzzle. Half, you're kind of jumping around but the thing that every every character storyline it starts with a tree yes and that is something that um i thought was really beautiful that just every every family was so affected by a certain mm -hmm. tree <laughs> i guess we could just name the characters and maybe briefly mm -hmm. kind of introduce what is going on with them um, I so I think the, yeah, I think the first person that we meet is Nicholas Hole. Hole. Okay. They have like this homestead in rural Iowa and, um, throughout Nick's family history, they've been, there's been kind of this like folk art project sort of where they've been taking a picture of this one tree for generations. And you can kind of see, like, do like a time-lapse, I guess, of how the tree has grown over the generations. Um, and this was an American chestnut tree, which all the reviews and the summaries I was reading kept saying it was a chestnut tree, which it has chestnut in the name, but it is specifically an American chestnut tree, which is significant because those are basically extinct now. The American chestnut was kind of like the East Coast version of a redwood. Um, and we've basically lost all of them now, which is just horrible. Basically, there was like a blight and it wiped out like all of the trees from like Canada all the way through like the American Midwest, which is just yeah. an enormous swath of land. Um, it's just like tons and tons and tons of trees were lost. So yeah, this American chestnut tree that Nick Hole has is kind of like one of the last of its kind. And um, it's really special that they've been able to take pictures of it for so long. Um, but yeah, Nick is an artist. And so- Yeah, so when we meet him, he's kind of a down in the dumps yeah waiting for his life to really start yeah so the next character is olivia and she olivia vandergriff excuse me she's a college student and it's like an old house so like the wiring the electricity is kind of like yeah it's a little iffy and yeah she like basically electrocutes herself and nearly dies so as she's kind of like in this in between state like um between life and death she has sort of like an epiphany I guess you might say and these like beings of light uh kind of come to her and voices which I guess are kind of like yeah. like spirits of the trees almost is kind of how I interpreted that yeah some kind of natural beings nature, yeah nature's voices kind of speaking to her telling her where she needs to be in order to right set some kind of domino effect yeah in motion mm-hmm the voices yeah. just stay with her throughout the entire story and they yeah. tell her like yes you're going in the right way or you should you should stop along the side of this road yeah. and, and weird things like that 
follow the sign for the art gallery <laughs> yes. down there. Yeah. And um, that leads her to yeah. Nicholas. And so they're headed west mm -hmm. um, to join with some protests that are protesting the clearing of old growth forests for yeah. lumber industry. So they go off and they go to, like head to, I guess, like Oregon, California. And then we're introduced to another character, uh, Mimi Ma. She's the daughter of Chinese immigrants. Um, and her father, um, he was really big on taking them to go see the national parks. And he had this mulberry tree that was in their backyard when they were growing up, she and her sister uh, growing up. And that was always like a really big thing in her life was that mulberry tree. And she kind of like associated it with her father. Um, so she's an engineer and I think she's living in Portland, Oregon when we meet her. Well, there's like this, this grove of pine trees and that's where mm -hmm. she goes and has her lunch and kind of yes in the rest of this kind of developed business park it's like the one little patch of green mm -hmm. um, um and yeah. yeah that's kind of around the time when she meets another character um named douglas pavlicek mm -hmm. and doug is a a vietnam veteran vietnam war veteran um there was actually a tree in vietnam that was kind of his introduction to trees i guess which was like the banyan tree i think mm -hmm. yeah because he fell he his was it a plane or a helicopter i can't remember yeah, but um some kind of flying it was, craft yeah some kind of flying craft <laughs> yeah <laughs> um was attacked and blown out of the sky basically and he he fell and was caught by this banyan tree yeah. so he was basically saved by this banyan tree uh, after the war he uh obviously comes back home um, and he realizes that um, deforestation is a really big problem in the United States at that time, still is. Um, so he kind of devotes himself to trying to reforest uh, yeah. different parts of the country. Yeah, and then he has a really kind of sad realization. It is really sad. Yeah. It's really sad. He spends, I think it's decades that he spends just, a long just time. Walking, walking along and planting a tree and he gets paid like a penny a seed or something yeah minuscule and um and he reaches the point where he plants was it fifty thousand trees it's a lot or something it's it was a lot, lot of trees. trees yeah um and he goes to to celebrate in a pub and somebody's like well you know who's paying you to pay to plant those trees or the people <laughs> who are gonna chop them down and when mm -hmm. they're big enough to turn them into lumber and yeah you're just feeding the machine yeah and this of course breaks douglas's kind of what? Yeah. sanity and his his idea that he's doing something good and then he realizes it's actually not yeah. making all for any nothing. difference to like replacing what's been lost yeah he's oh, just working for the logging companies um but yeah th this is kind of when um like after he has this realization that's i guess kind of when his story and mimi ma's intersect mm -hmm. um and he's um in portland because they're starting to cut down the trees in the clearing that mimi takes her lunch in mimi is there and is heartbroken because they've cut down these trees that reminded her of her father and the places yeah. that they used to go when she was a child mm -hmm. so this is kind of like the i guess like the catalyst for mm -hmm. when mimi sort of starts to become radicalized i guess you could say and like douglas was involved with these protests so they kind of um, become pals and like protest buddies and they start going to like these protests to um, object to the logging companies coming in and cutting down all the old growth like redwood forests um, in the Pacific Northwest. And yeah, that's this is kind of around the time when all the characters or at least the characters that do meet end up meeting each other. Yeah, definitely. I think the last one that actually joins those that group is Adam. Yeah, he's a student, he's studying psychology, mm -hmm. and um, he chooses, uh, for his, it's a master's, I think, for his thesis topic, Yeah, he chooses to study the protesters, um, mm -hmm. and this question of why are people standing up for trees? What yeah. is it about trees that um, people feel pushed to, sometimes violence, to protect mm -hmm. them? Yeah. And, um, and also the other side, everybody cutting down the trees. What are they not seeing about the trees that make mm -hmm. them able to, to yeah. cut them down? Right. So he was going around interviewing a lot of the 
a lot of the protesters. Yeah. When he so. meets Olivia and Nick up yes. in the tree platform on one of the oldest trees mm -hmm. in on the west coast, a tree called Mimus. Yeah. So Mimus is like this giant tree and um Nick and Olivia and then eventually Adam are trying to protect it from the logging companies who <laughs> want to come in and chop it down for lumber. And um they meet up with Mimi Ma and mm -hmm. um Douglas. Yeah. For further protests. <laughs> yeah. But I guess the, the logical next step would be Dr. Westerford because yeah, um, yeah. she's involved with the court case against these protesters. Mm -hmm. um, so she gets called in as, a wit as an expert witness um, yes. because she is a botanist. Her major discovery was um, that plants communicate and yeah. that they, they have their own language, that they're not these inanimate objects that we think right. they are. So basically, she was trying to give them a little bit more um, identity, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, in saying that they communicate. And the scientific community just dumped on her. And so her name was pretty much slandered. She couldn't get a job anywhere. Nobody wanted to hire her. Yeah, um, she's kind of a laughing stock. Yeah. Which was really sad. so sad. I mean, I know. <laughs> you would, you would, you kind of hope that the push towards something towards seeing nature as something other than like can't feel any pain or can be used by humans would mm -hmm. come from the scientific community and then it's the scientific community that just destroys it which is yeah. so sad for me <laughs> yeah i know yeah. but i guess yeah, silver linings it did it did drive her to meet the people who were working in the forest who yeah were, um kind of saw things more her way mm -hmm. and um and she started writing books and tried to teach non-scientists everything she knew about trees and all these people are like whoa that's amazing like i had no idea trees could talk to each other and um yeah she's yeah that's kind of how she's vindicated later in life um yep. and basically gets a lot of speaking gigs and stuff like that going around the world talking about this and eventually that's why she gets pulled into um the court case against the protesters because yeah. she's she knows so much about trees and she is brought in to kind of testify to the value the natural intrinsic value of leaving trees where they are yeah and um and not cutting them down so basically trying to defend the the protesters um stance in an economic financial way because sadly is so that weird. is the kind yeah. of language that um, speaks to people. The people who make this decision <laughs> understand and that is the language that they speak so that is the language yeah. that we also have to speak right so she was making the case that you should just leave forests alone because of all these things that they do they give you medicines and they yes. produce air and they clean your water and mm -hmm. they do all of these wonderful things that you don't even realize until you've cut them down and then they stop doing it and then you have to figure out a way to do it yourself yeah i guess that might be a good segue to talk about um two other characters who appear in the book which would be ray brinkman and dorothy casley i think is how you mm -hmm. say her last name um but they're a husband and wife uh pair and ray is a i think he was an intellectual property lawyer and then um dorothy was a stenographer and they read to each other and eventually they pick up this book this mm -hmm everything about trees book that um dr westerford has written yep and um and the just opens a whole new world for them and they look out their window and they try and identify all the trees that they have in their garden and mm -hmm. um, in their neighborhood and uh they realize well our garden is not as natural and wild as it could be and so <laughs> they go on this rewilding yeah. project which i love they kind of get into this uh, legal battle with the mm -hmm. city, I think. Basically, Ray starts to kind of make a legal case for rights for nature. Um, and that's like a whole thing that the book goes into, which is pretty interesting. You sent me a really interesting quote by the author um, for the kind of the motivation yes. behind, behind writing the book. And that is kind of linked to this. Uh, Richard Powers said, the real question for humanity now is whether we can find stories that confront what it will take for us to live among non-humans in a permanent way. Writers mm -hmm. need to turn their eyes outward and start asking what kinds of values we would need to develop 
what myths we need to tell ourselves and what perceptions we need to cultivate to truly live here and not in an imaginary self-exempting place that externalizes all costs and acknowledges only private and individual meaning. <laughs> it's a much more beautiful way of saying we really need to stop being so egotistical and realize that we're part of a bigger system yeah and we appreciate are, the bigger system right we're part of nature not a part from nature i guess is yeah what exactly is. yeah um so yeah i think that that might be a good place to um just to finally finish talking about all of our characters <laughs> the last character is nile um nile mata who is a uh, video game developer which i thought was a pretty cool uh, narrative um but he like all the other characters he also has a relationship with trees um, except his is kind of a bad one at it's first. It's not a great one. No, it's not a great start. Um, he basically climbed up into a tree and then he fell out of the tree and broke his back and uh, became wheelchair bound and he was like paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of his life. So um, yeah, he ended up becoming a very successful video game developer. Um, he kind of becomes like a sort of like Silicon Valley magnate, I guess, or like a billionaire. And uh, makes this really successful video game franchise called Mastery. It's basically a, a world that you, as the player, influence what it yeah. looks like and how it develops and how it builds. So yeah. you have power as a player um, to use up resources and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And he took inspiration from trees. He wanted to... He wanted to replicate kind of the intricacy and the complexity of trees yeah. and the perfection of of what they are and how what they create and and the balance that they have and gamification is a huge thing and yeah. people are, are are using it now to try and get this message across as well mm -hmm. um there was i did a i did an episode on um eco fiction in video games and there were a, yeah. a few a few examples of um video games that were trying to just send environmental messages ecological messages and one of them is called eco yes. where it is pretty much exactly like this there's a world yep. and you have to save it and you have to develop it but you have finite resources and it has to be a collaborative effort you don't really do things by yourself because mm -hmm. you won't get very far so you have to collaborate and you have finite resources and your goal is to not kill everything <laughs> yeah so, basically to build like a sustainable society yeah which sounds um, so hard <laughs> Yeah, and there was, yeah, a, big, there was a big discussion about it whether um, it was useful because people because it's hard people mm -hmm. stop playing it like it's, it's oh okay interesting in, like they the discussion I guess is whether they toe the line enough kind yeah of make it hard so that it's a challenge so that people want to beat it um, yeah but not so hard that people are like oh this is not I fun. give up yeah. <laughs> um, um oh, so yeah. yeah so i think we've covered all the storylines now all the finally kind of important finally and so now i guess i guess we can we can just talk about how how we found it i mean yeah there's so many there's so much to talk about there's so many storylines and so many massive messages that he that he has mm -hmm. and i guess one of the one of my big things was that i just felt <laughs> no hope while i was reading this book yeah. um i get on my channel i talk a lot about the need for hope in our fiction because uh -huh. the lack of hope is so demotivating yes and people say oh well if it's that bad then if there's no hope then why should i try and actually when i was first looking up eco fiction and discovering the genre a lot of people sent me to the overstory to search for um because it was a title that they said had a lot of hope. Oh. <laughs> I do not, I do not, and they really? swindled me. <laughs> yeah, you've been bamboozled. <laughs> I've been bamboozled. I ranted to you about this before, and you had a really good comeback. And you, yeah. did, you did have a good point that said, you know, the, the purpose of resistance is to resist. The fact that there are people who are standing up for for mm -hmm. it and using their voices to speak out against it um yeah that was that like is a... that is comforting yeah like hope is important and um like hope and a lot of times is what is like the only thing that keeps people going when the going gets really hard but also 
I think what a lot of people don't realize is that hope is an act. It's a verb. Um, it's not just um, a philosophy or a viewpoint that you have. It is um, like showing up to protest. It's planting trees. It's um, basically just like defying the forces that are seeking to destroy us, I guess, in a word. Um, so that's where, um, I guess that's what I kind of found hopeful about this book was just the courage and the bravery on display from all the characters in the book. Even though they are up against impossible odds, there's like realistically like no way they could have one in their situation. Um, and I, it's important to also remember that this book, I think, was set in the 90s, at least when all of the big protests were happening um, with the main characters. So like, again, this was a time when um, like the collective consciousness was not as awake to the climate mm -hmm. emergency as it is now. Yeah. yeah, they were just up against impossible odds. But despite that, they fought basically until the end anyway, even though they knew they were probably going to lose and they just did it because it was the right thing to do and because they had such a strong yeah. moral conviction. But I think that's something else that I really like about all the different storylines is that they all do yeah. what they can to to try and make something better. Even, yeah. even if it's Ray and Dorothy in their back garden, just rewilding their garden. That yeah. is something that they say, on, in, in the scope of my life, this is something this is that what I, I can do. do. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's a really Westerford good point. writes her books and um, collects her seeds, and mm -hmm. Nilay builds his builds his game that he thinks yeah. he can reach people in. And yep. yeah, the rest of the characters, they do join protests, and they are very what we kind of typically think of as activism. They mm -hmm. are very active. I think that's something that's really nice about these storylines. They kind of give your, you know, this idea of activism, that there are levels of acti activism. Yeah. Kind of do little things. Yeah, and it kind of just drives home the point that a lot of scientists try to make, which is just like, like you were saying, like, not everybody has to be out in the streets, like you need, like, we need just like everybody to be doing what they can do in their own way. Um, mm -hmm. Because there is no silver bullet to stopping something as colossal and like horrible as climate change, like it's going to take a billion different people coming at it from a billion different approaches to really, you know, make any kind of meaningful um, impact. Um, well, I did like that, um, several things, um, one that trees were kind of like characters in the book. So yeah. they were sort of like non-human character, which I think is, um, a powerful thing that you can have in works of eco-fiction or just any kind of story you're trying to tell that will, uh, make the reader more empathetic to what's going on. And isn't it funny that for us to empathize with something, we have to make them human. Um, yeah, but he just it, it's really it's not that easy to make a tree a character and he no. does it so beautifully and mm -hmm. it's just it's a joy to read yeah. what, his writing um and the other thing is that he has put so much information into this book like yeah. real information yeah stuff that you can fact check and um and mm -hmm. you learn something you learn so much by reading this book and it's not a book that you will finish and not be impacted by right. i think it's a very impactful book um of course the fact that it has so much information like and so many stats and so many mm -hmm. kind of oh, just the research he must have done to write this book is you read so many books staggering. to write this one you um, read like nearly 200 books i think i read that's just it's yeah, just insane a lot. i mean <laughs> that's commitment <laughs> But um, I guess that is also something that might turn some people off. I mean, yeah, this is true. not a subtle book. Let's no. put it that way. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I talk about ecofiction being this like science communication ninja because you're yeah. reading a really great, That's a great book. Way to put it. Yeah, um, you're reading a really great book with great characters, and you're drawn into it. And oh, just along the way, you pick up some yeah some nuggets of information that you then keep. Mm -hmm. um, this is not that kind of book. This book has all the problems and all the facts laid out and then it just smushes them into your face <laughs> you cannot miss the messaging in this book the, the narratives revolve around these messages yeah. and um and that might be a lot for some people especially if it's not coupled with this hope um mm -hmm. and so i think it's like a bull in a china shop it's, it's just kind yeah of no totally it's just destruction everywhere <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. but it is yeah it is very 
heavy on the stats and the information, but I, that is something that I quite liked because I, when I finished it, I felt like I had a better grasp of the situation that it was talking about. Mm -hmm. And it didn't just pass over me. It's something that, that I kind of kept. Yeah. I learned a lot from it too, from like a nonfiction point of view. Yeah, exactly. Um, It's almost like creative nonfiction. You kind of forget that you're reading fiction. It's just like a documentary series. Yeah, it does in some ways kind of feel like a documentary. Um, Like one of the main things, one of the main themes in the book is uh, storytelling and Mm -hmm. uh, the power that it has to change people's minds. And, um, you know, like Adam Appich said, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said like, um, all the statistics in the world won't change somebody's mind, but a good story can. Um, and then you're like, oh, okay, like I see what you're doing here. Um, but <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah, I, I get that criticism of the book saying that it's, you know, like um, very um, polemical and like trying to change people's minds. And it's kind of like a diatribe against uh, you know, like everything that we're doing wrong. It's it's one of the criticisms that ecofiction as a kind of genre or category yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. you want to think of it um, gets a lot is that, well, why would I want to read that? I don't want to be preached to. Yeah. Um, and it's it's true. I don't want to be preached to either. Um, and so I don't know if I would necessarily like if you if you type if you Google ecofiction and it'll come up with loads of lists the top 10 yeah. ecofiction books you know books to get you started in ecofiction and the mm-hmm. overstory is always on there yep. and I'm thinking this is not the one to start with <laughs> no 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 it'll probably turn you <laughs> off from the whole genre this is a soft entry into no. ecofiction um, this is a hard crash landing entry yes. <laughs> into ecofiction and I enjoyed the book but I am already a convert it's it's like a preaching to the choir kind of situation here yeah I kind um, of had that thought too someone who's on the fence I don't like, know if they would have made it through this giant book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is a um I'm glad you said that cuz that is a thing that I struggle a lot with ecofiction. Yeah, like stories are important, but like if I make this too overt or if I make it mm-hmm. too obvious if I show my hand like what I'm trying to do here, only the people that already care about this are going yeah. to read it. Yeah, um, exactly. Then the magic trick is over. And it's it's interesting because that's the whole point of ecofiction being kind of a science communication tool yeah. or having the potential to be a science communication tool that it's going to reach people who don't read academic papers and they don't read the the new stories on on climate change and inform mm-hmm. themselves about the facts and things um this is the way to reach people who they, they don't confront it in their everyday lives kind of thing and so they yeah. start reading book for the story that it tells and they end up being exposed to things that they aren't normally exposed to yeah and um that's something that i think is super powerful um Mm -hmm. but yeah this this one even though it is definitely ecofiction and it's strong and it's Mm -hmm. and it's impactful when you do read it i don't think it's necessarily going to reach people who are like but i just wanted a nice story yeah (laughs) so i think in, in recommending it to people, I think I would put a couple of um, conditions in there. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing that I took away from the book that I had to sort of learn myself in real life, um, and I think I'd kind of sort of come to understand this before I had picked up this book, but um, if you're first getting involved in a movement like this, it is extremely frustrating when you're first starting out because, I mean, it continues to be frustrating. But especially when you're first starting out, you're like, I don't get it. Like, why isn't th- why aren't things getting better? Like, we're doing so much work. Um, like, why don't people get this? Like, you know, I'm I'm putting everything into this. Um, why isn't the message clicking? And I think that is maybe like one good thing that can be said about the book is that it uh, draws attention to that fact and it's realistic in that way. Struggles like this just they don't happen overnight. So you have to acknowledge that, and um, it takes perseverance, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you made like die before you see um things get better and that's just something that you have to accept going into it otherwise you're going to get burned out and you're going to um become hopeless and you'll give up and then you know if that happens if if enough people do that the whole movement loses steam and everything kind of falls apart so um, yeah yeah and i guess that's that's exactly i mean the 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 size of some of those issues that you were just talking about it's not going to be solved by 
one person, two people. It needs mm -hmm. to be solved by so many people taking action and raising their voice and um, taking a stand, even though the, just the task is so huge. Yeah. Um, if the activism that gets people's attention happens mm -hmm. to be chaining yourself to a tree or <laughs> whatever, then yeah. Sometimes that's that is what is needed. So I guess getting the ball rolling. Maybe yeah. maybe that's what the book is doing. It's getting, you know, showing yeah. all these different forms of activism to get the ball rolling. Yeah, when when you think about um you know, like things like the events in this book, um they led to um bigger movements uh, like what we have today with like the Fridays for Future movement in Europe. Um and you have like the school children which is horrible that school children are having to be the people to sound the alarm on this and to get people to wake up but um it's happening and it's working um and you have things like extinction rebellion in the uk which is does a lot of uh, really great stuff and then in the us you have things like the sunrise movement and you have movements like these all around the world so in in that sense i think it is encouraging just because you you didn't see it necessarily at the end of this book um things like that led the groundwork for um bigger um arguably maybe more successful movements that we have today so yeah 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 for sure so you can see this book in many different ways yeah it's complicated <laughs> it's complicated so the overstory by richard powers as recapped by... there it is yeah <laughs> by us um it is fascinating it is heartbreaking it is huge it is mm -hmm. complex it'll make you feel all the feelings it's um, controversial it's super controversial not subtle no and um <laughs> but i still recommend reading it if you feel up to it yeah if you're like in the i guess the headspace to read it then it's a good read for sure um yeah Oh, well, this was fun. I'm yeah. so glad I didn't try and try and encapsulate this whole book into a my normal 10 minute book review yeah, because it wouldn't have too. done it any justice. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for joining me to talk about this book. Thank you for inviting me. This is a, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity. This is like a massive <laughs> honor to be on the Ecofictology YouTube channel. I'm oh, just like so geeking you. out when you told me that uh, you want to do this together. So thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> this was yep. good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Well, that was lovely. <laughs> All right.